when we ask Hawk what the type of this uh, uh, definition or this expression is, it's going to tell us it has the type nat arrow prop. That is, give me a nap and I will give you a statement or a proposition. So, let me stop that. Uh, right, so uh, in Cock, if we have a, a function of this flavor that uh, takes some arguments and returns a proposition that defines properties of that, uh, or uh, returns a proposition, we say it defines properties of those arguments, right? So, for instance, here is a polymorphic property of injectivity. Uh, this is a concept that we saw in the previous lecture when we were talking about uh, 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 inductive data type definitions and their constructors, but we can make uh, an assertion about any sort of function. Um, so here, the injective uh, proposition uh, has two, two type arguments, and it takes a function from the first type to the second, and says that for all arguments, if, uh, uh, if f of x equals f of y, then, the, uh, then x equals y, right? And now we can you reuse this property to make an assertion about a particular function. In this case, the constructor, the successor constructor. Uh, we can reuse this definition in it and then write the proof as we would expect. Okay. So again, every statement, every sort of mathematical fact you can insert in Coq has the uh, has the type prop. So equality, the equality operation that we've seen previously also returns a prop. So uh, the expression n equals m, as it says here, is just a syntactic trigger for a particular definition, eq, uh, which returns a property uh, on the two arguments that you pass it. Right? Uh, of course, as we note here, because eq can be applied to any type, it's polymorphic in the type of the arguments. So if we check the type of eq, we'll see it takes a type, it takes two arguments of that type, and it returns a proposition, a statement about those, uh, about those particular arguments. Okay. Here's the interactive part. Uh, I will ask you, what is the type of the following expression? Uh, think about it, and I guess raise your hand when you're done. Uh, okay, someone shout it out. The, the type of the following expression is, oh, one, yeah, sorry. It's like, <laughs> give the number, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, that sounds right to me, okay. Uh, what is the type of this expression? Think about it. Two. Uh, is it? Uh, it's okay. So I have. Who thinks it's one? Okay, that one is correct. Okay, so why isn't this two? So, yeah, this is a little bit tricky. Uh, and. Yeah, we'll get to that point in a second. So this is a proposition. So this is just a mathematical statement. So this for all is just one way we have of building up propositions, right? So this is, it, it's just a statement. So it has type prop. Uh, what is the type of this expression? Uh, one. one, right. Uh, exactly right, because again, this is just some assertion. It turns out that this is a not true assertion because if n is zero, we, uh, this won't hold, right? So this won't hold for all n. But again, we don't care about uh, uh, truth, we're just caring about assertions. Okay, what is the type of this expression? Uh, think about it. Four, the, the, the statement is four, okay. Why is, this, uh, why is this not typable? Why does this make sense? Well, uh, think of it this way. This for all quantifier quantifies over some argument and it's followed by a proposition, right? So, oh, okay. So the uh, expression that follows the for all quantifier, it, what type does it have? Nat, right. So you can't, uh, the for all quantifier expects to be followed by a proposition. It's followed by something of type nat. It thus doesn't type check. Cock will throw a, a typing error. Um, here we go. What is the type of this expression? Nat to nat. Nat, nat, to nat. Yes, three. Exactly right. Because it takes an argument of type nat and returns a natural number. What about this expression? Two, exactly right. So here is an example of an expression 
that takes a natural number and gives you a prop, a proposition, as opposed to that for all statement, which was itself just a proposition. Okay. Oh, here's a good one. Which of the following is not a proposition? So which of the following expressions, if you checked it in cock, would uh, not give you a prop back as the type? Three. Three. Yes, exactly right. Um, what is the type of that expression? Bool, exactly right. Yep. Okay. Okay, so again, just to recap, propositions are simply the type that are assigned to statements of, uh, are statements of mathematical facts. Um, and again, these are first class objects, so in Cox, so yes? So is, is the type prop inductively defined? If so, what are its No, it is not inductively defined. Okay. So. Yes, uh, and in fact, we will see how to define your own uh, inhabitants of, of prop next mor uh, tomorrow morning. But the way to think of this right now is that uh, just as type is sort of the uber type for many things, prop is the uber type for uh, propositions. Okay, and just as you can introduce your own types using the inductive keyword, you can introduce your own propositions in a way that we'll see tomorrow morning. I don't want to give it away. But before we, yes? So if I have a free variable, it's mm -hmm. not quantified. Does that count as a prop? Like x, x plus 5 equals 7. If you just had the expression x plus 5 equals 7. Now, assuming that x had not been defined previously and it hasn't been assigned a definition, cock will throw an error because you're not allowed to have an open expression like that. Okay, so I can't get it. It, it is not a well-formed expression. It's not well -formed. Yes. Every, every variable needs to be bound by a quantifier or be attached to some definition. It's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. So if type is the type of types and prop is the corresponding one, why do we have this distinction? Why don't we have propositions and past types? Uh, so you're asking what is the distinction between prop and type? Why are we making this distinction? So the, the reason for this, I don't want to get into too much detail, but the intuition is that uh, props are referred to proofs, and these things aren't computationally relevant. And at a high level, what this means is when we call, use Cox extraction mechanism to uh, produce equivalent OCaml expressions, everything that lives in type will actually produce an OCaml definition, and things that live in prop will get erased. And there are other deeper reasons for this, but... So it's not just a pra practical research. So if I wanted to have propositions as types, I could just interpret my types as propositions, but not as prop, and then they would be computationally relevant when we extract the algorithm. I, I think the short answer to that is yes. Make sure to repeat questions for that. Oh, thank you. Uh, so let me see if I can repeat your question. Your question was, could we also uh, define similar uh, statements uh, and assign them type type and have them be computationally relevant and get extracted. Was that the, the question? And the answer is yes. Uh, you, can, you can do that. But uh, indeed, part of the reason for using prop is as a signal that you don't want this to be extracted. It is not important as a mathematical statement, something that doesn't live, uh, it does not represent a function or a term that you want to be computed. I think it's the right intuition. Any other questions? Other questions? So, nope. Uh, yep. So we see both of those objects. So we get that those two not in prop state. So, yes. So the question of type prop, we can do a proof for that. Yes. So uh, the question was uh, do expressions of type prop, we, when we want to write a proof, we have an expression of type prop and we write a proof for it to show that it's true. And that is exactly right. So when we, when we define a theorem, we make a statement. The statement has type prop, and the proof script we write generates evidence that that assertion is true or statement is true. Yep. OK. So if there are no more questions, now we're going to look at how to uh, so far, like we, I said on the first slide, we've only seen three ways of building up props. We have for all quantification, we have um, arrows for implication, and we had equalities. So now we're going to see how we can build up uh, 
propositions, larger propositions, using a variety of logical connectives that should hopefully look familiar to you. Um, the first of these is, of course, uh, conjunction. So uh, conjunction or logical and is something that people may have seen before, probably have seen before. And this is uh, just a way of asserting that a facts, propositions A and proposition B are both true. And we write this using the logical and connective, which looks like a little wedge. So as an example, here is, uh, we're, we're asserting that both three plus four equals seven and two times two equals four. Um, so let me switch over to my proof buffer here. Oops. And make sure that this is readable for folks in the back. This is an example. So before, we had a couple of tactics that allowed us to solve goals of the form, uh, you know, x equals y. Right, we had this reflexivity tactic. And correspondingly, there's a tactic that lets us solve goals of the form, or make progress, I should say, on goals of the form A and B. Uh, and in particular, the tactic we, we use for, uh, for logical and is called the split tactic. So just off the top of your head, if you want to prove A and B, what do you need to prove? A. Right, you need to prove A, <laughs> and you need to prove B. And that is precisely what the split tactic does. It, I mean, it follows this intu intuition precisely. So uh, here we go. Oops, let me bump up the size here. Hopefully. There we go. So when we, call it, when we use split, we're going to get two sub-goals. So this works on, uh, for right now, we can just imagine this works in goals of the type A and B. And we call split, and we get two new sub-goals, proving the left conjunct and proving the right conjunct. And of course, once we've done that, we can apply uh, the tactic that we have in hand for dealing with goals of the, of, uh, that look like equalities. So reflexivity solves this goal, and reflexivity solves the next goal, as you might expect. Um, similarly, uh, this, uh, so this, this pattern of, of using split works for any proposition. Uh, so if we want to prove, we can write a proof that sort of quanti uh, exhibits this fact that for any A and B, if we can show A and we can show B, then we can show A and B um, in just the way that you would probably expect. Okay. Um, Uh, so uh, all this slide is saying is that this, uh, this and intro um, lemma that we proved before has the same effect as using split. It's going to generate two sub-goals, one for each of these assumptions of this proof uh, of the and intro proof. So if we apply and intro, we're going to end up in the exact same proof state with the same sub-goals that we had when we used split. Um, yes, uh, I'm going to skip over the next one because we're running a little bit behind because of our, our uh, AV issues. Okay, so this is how you reason about goals or manipulate goals which have a conjunct in them. Uh, what if we want, we have some conjuncts as a set of hypotheses? What if, for instance, we know uh, that n equals zero and m equals zero, and we're trying to prove that n plus m equals zero? Okay, so this is how do we, uh, whereas before we were sort of working backwards from the goal, here if we have some and fact and we want to work forward from that, how do we do it? Well. Um, the solution is to use oop, the destruct tactic. So in much the same way that we could, uh, well, I want to say that. So uh, here we can do intros, and now h has type n equals 0 and m equals 0. And when we destruct h, what do we get? Well, uh, we get two new assumptions, namely the left conjunct and the right conjunct. Um, this as statement here works just as we saw before with the destruct. It gives names to each of the, the uh, assumptions that we're introducing to the goal, or into the, uh, uh, into the proof. Uh, and now, once we have these in hand, we can actually rewrite with hn and rewrite with hm. And now we have 0 equals 0, and we're done. So no, okay, so why did we have to do that? Well, imagine we tried to, oh, nope, I'm not going to go up. I'm not going to do that. Okay. Not going to go overboard. Okay. Uh, uh, 
uh, one thing to note is that uh, it says, as usual here, I'm not sure if we saw this in the previous, in the previous lectures, but we can actually destruct these ands right when we introduce them. So by using this uh, bracket pattern matching uh, syntax here, it's going to intros n and m, and the brackets mean uh, intros this as h, and then immediately call destruct as using these two names. Yeah. Can we invert the prop instead of destructing? Sorry, the question was, can we invert the, the assumption instead of uh, destructing? And the answer is, yes, it works in this case. Um, uh, I, yes, that's all I'll say about that. Okay, so. Uh, right, so you might have noticed on that this, this idea, why would we ever end up with ands in the, uh, as an, uh, why would we ever end up with an assumption that has this and form, right? Because as we saw, this is isomorphic to just making two assumptions, right? We can just assume n equals zero and m equals zero. So why would we ever end up with a goal state that looks like this? Well, uh, for the present example, both things work, but sometimes when you're working on a goal, you might want to assert some intermediate um, proposition or statement and prove it and then use it. So as an example, um, let's, Uh, let me, here we go. So as an example here, uh, when we're, we're trying to prove this goal, uh, uh, we're trying to show that n times m equals zero, assuming that n plus m equals zero. The natural way to prove this is to first show that n equals zero and m equals zero. Um, and we can do that by asserting this intermediate goal. Uh, we saw this tactic a little bit earlier. Now we have to prove this goal, which is follow straightforwardly from some other sublemma that we've used previously. Uh, and after we prove it, we have this assumption in hand, but now we have an and and we need some way of working with it. So we'll use destruct and proceed as before. Um, there, are, there are other cases where and will crop up in an assumption and we'll see one of those uh, actually a little bit later in this, in this lecture. Okay. And uh, just as an aside, this little wedge operator is actually syntactic sugar for uh, uh, so A and, and AB in much the same way as the equality symbol is actually uh, syntactic sugar for this uh, an EQ um, uh, identifier. So what is the type of and? Well, if we check it, it's going to take a prop and another prop representing the two sides and it's going to give us a new prop. Okay, so that's and. Uh, just to recap, if we have an and in the goal, we can use split and we'll get two new sub goals. If we have an and in the assumption, we can use destruct and we'll get two new assumptions. Okay, we have and. Yes? Uh, on and, some sort of inductive type then, because we're using destruct, or is it just a coincidence that we're using destruct here? So the question was, is uh, and a inductive type because we're using destruct just as we did with other inductive types or is it some weird coincidence? And the answer is, it is no coincidence. They are an inductive type and we'll look at that definition in more detail tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, any other questions? Good. Uh, okay, so we have ands. You have ands, what's the, the, the complement of and? Uh, it's or. Uh, as you probably remember from your Boolean logic class or when you did your circuit design. So uh, in Koch, of course, we have a uh, conjunction for, or for taking the disjunction of two uh, propositions, which is right A, uh, A or B, as we see here. Um, the definition, well, yeah, we'll go aside. So, okay, how do we, use, how do we uh, prove statements that have an or in them? How do we work with goals that have or in them? So. Oh wait, are we going to, to use, okay, we're gonna look at hypotheses first. Okay, so here's our or example. So what do we do if we have an assumption that is of the form uh, A or B? So here's an example. We know either N equals zero or M equals zero, and we wanna show that N times M equals zero. So if you were doing this by hand, how would you go about proving this? Like, what would you do? 
you would do a case analysis on that OR, right? So you knew either n equals zero or m equals zero, and that's precisely what we're going to do here. So uh, here we have this, uh, we're going to use this special uh, intro syntax, uh, and it's going to produce two sub goals, one for uh, where we have, we get to assume that n equals zero, and one where we get to assume that m equals zero. Uh, in the case that m, n equals zero, we can rewrite with that and use reflexivity. Similarly, if m equals zero, we'll do the same thing. Um, the idea here is that uh, whereas uh, if we had an assumption about and, we get to we get two, we get one resulting sub goal when we do case analysis on it, right? We get to assume both of the facts. Here, when we're doing case analysis on disjunction, we don't get both of the facts because there are two ways, effectively, we could have built up this proposition A or B. We could have built it up with A or we could have built it up with B. And so in order to prove that this holds uh, under both cases, we have to show that it holds for both cases, right? Um, right, so this case analysis pattern uh, HN or HM uh, allows us to name the hypotheses that are generated and that's why we have a nice handle so that we can use when we do the rewriting. Um, you could imagine that we could have done an intros of H and then destructed it, uh, and we would have gotten, we would have ended up in a similar proof state with two proof, two proof obligations. Um, okay, so that's what you do when you have an OR as an assumption. What do we need to do when we have an OR in the goal? How do we prove uh, something of the type A or B? Okay, well, this is a little bit more pleasant than uh, when we have an assumption, right? So if we wanna show A or B, what do we need to show? A. Or B, right? <laughs> it seems a, a little counterintuitively, but if we write down that as a, as a, as a proposition or a statement or a, the, a theorem in cock or a lemma in cock, uh, it makes a little bit more sense, right? So what is this saying? This says, this or intro, uh, the statement of this or intro lemma says, for any propositions, if you give me an A, I can give you A or B, right? Uh, and so what do we do here? We, uh, we intros these assumptions, and now the, the tact we have tactics for working with goals of the form that, uh, the goals that have disjunctions. So there's a left tactic, and what this says is, I will prove the left-hand side of this disjunction. So once we apply left, we have a new goal of type uh, that says I need to prove A. Conveniently, we have that assumption, uh, H of A. So we can just apply that directly, and we're done. Um, if you can imagine a similar proof uh, where you get to assume B, can you imagine what the tactic might be that you would use there? Right, right, uh, exactly right, yeah. Um, so uh, here's an example of a case where we might need to use uh, both left and right in conjunction or with each other, disjunction with each other. Okay, so here, let me get this more in the middle of the screen here. Uh, we're going to do case analysis on n, this natural number. Uh, here we need to show either that zero equals zero or zero equals successor of something, uh, well, predecessor of zero. Um, obviously, we're going to want to prove the left-hand side because that's easier, we'll call left. We'll get the right, uh, the left sub goal. We'll solve that using reflexivity. Uh, in the other case, uh, we're going to want to prove the right-hand side of the, the, the right disjunct. Uh, here, well, we just need to show this equality, which is trivially true by simplification. We can call reflexivity on it, and we're done. Um, it's, it's worth re-emphasizing here, you probably noticed this when you're working through your homework, but you can imagine that reflexivity implicitly calls simple before it gets run. So you don't actually have to simplify a goal before calling reflexivity. And that's why I didn't need to simple away that uh, predecessor successor um, expression. Okay, so we have ands, we have ors. Uh, another interesting uh, logical um, operator is not, right? So uh, what's interesting about not is so far we've only, we've exclusively proved things that are true, right? We've proved that uh, one equals one or one plus two equals two plus one, right? But sometimes you wanna prove things aren't true, right? So we might wanna prove that one is not equal to true or one is not equal to two. Um, in Koch, of course, we, we're going to use the logical negation operator, which is not right here. 
Um, now, it, it, it's worthwhile to see how, how this not uh, operator is actually defined. So, <clears throat> uh, we saw previously in the last lecture this idea that if you assume that we have this principle of explosion, the idea is if you have some contradictory assumption, everything follows from it, right? If you assume something that's false, you can immediately prove whatever you want, right? So, uh, you could exploit this intuition, right? And say, uh, if we want to show that not, pre, P, not P holds, right? We, all we would need to do is, or to, all we need to do is show that for any proposition, if we assume P, then that, uh, that Q or pro uh, assertion holds by default, right? Um, this actually makes sense, and, but Cock is going to do something a little bit different. The idea here is we're going to define not P as P implies false. Um, where false is this special uh, contradictory proposition that's defined in the standard library. If you stop and squint, you could see this is equivalent to the other definition, right? Or certainly the first definition. Okay, so maybe we can talk about that more offline. And uh, let's get back to the, uh, the actual lecture portion of the lecture. Um, okay, right. So, uh, right, here's a good example of uh, just as before when we had a contradictory assumption, we had one equals two, right? Uh, if we have the false, false as an assumption, we can immediately prove anything we want. And this is uh, what we see here with this x falso quod libet, uh, which means in Latin literally from false follows everything. Uh, I probably mispronounced it, but given that Latin is a dead language, I don't think anyone is really going to mind. So here, if we have... Uh, so we say for all possible propositions, that is for all statements, assuming false, we can prove that statement, right? So we can introduce, uh, we call intros, and now we have uh, this contradictory assumption false. So if we use, uh, if we say destruct on contra, uh, it immediately solves the goal. And this is true for, for any goal. If you have false, you can call destruct on it, and it will immediately solve the goal you're working on. We could have... Yes. Every year in the Vatican City, there is a uh, Latin as a live language conference that has more people than in this room. <laughs> okay. The the statement was that Latin is a alive and well in Vatican City, uh, <laughs> and uh, it is a valid statement. So I retract the my early one. <laughs> Uh, yes, anyway, uh, I, will, I will also note that just as we could have also used the inversion tactic to discharge this contradictory assumption. It works, sorry, I will, it would have worked just as well as calling destruct on false. Yeah. The inversion is for injectivity and disjoin us, and because there is no constructors, this works fine? Why would the, the question was, why does an inversion work on this goal? And... Maybe I should have introduced this uh, this formulation, but yes, because false has no constructors, inversion immediately solves the goal. That's the reason why. You can imagine that inversion is as one of the many things an inversion's large hammer is. It calls destruct. Uh, it uses destruct. Is the right I think the right intuition there. Um, okay. Okay, right, so here's an example of a, a theorem we might want to prove about some fact that is not true, right? We might want to prove that uh, zero equals one is false. Um, so recall that this not symbol here just expands into zero equals one implies false, right? So how can we prove this goal? Well, we'll introduce uh, as an assumption that zero equals one and our goal, remaining goal is going to be not. And once we have zero equals one, we can call inversion on it because it's a contradiction and it'll immediately discharge uh, the sub-goal. It, it turns out that proving dis, uh, uh, disequalities is so, uh, so common in cock, it actually has a special notation. Here it's x not equal to y, as you might be familiar. If you look in the actual, uh, if you look in the actual code base, uh, it has the form bump this up right here, x not equal to one, or zero not equal to one. Um, you'll probably be seeing that a lot. So 
<coughs> right. right. It, I'm going to skip over this statement uh, and let's look at this contradiction implies anything thing here. So this says that if we know P and not P, uh, we can conclude Q, where Q is any possible uh, proposition. Um, let me make sure I get this. Contradiction implies anything. So how does this proof go in uh, actually work under the hood? So what are we going to do? We're going to introduce P and Q, and we're also going to introduce this AND. And recall from earlier, when we use this special bracket notation when we're doing intros, it intros that assumption then immediately destructs it, uh, this AND, using these, uh, these two names for each of the uh, conjuncts that we have. So after we process this command, we get an assumption P, we get an assumption that uh, not P. Uh, if we unfold not in the, the second assumption, we see that uh, we get to assume P implies false. That's just the definition. Now we can use forward reasoning to uh, apply this P implies false in P. So if we have P and we know P implies false, of course we can conclude false. It's an example of forward reasoning. So now we have the assumption false. We can destruct it, and we're done. QED. Um, absolutely beautiful. OK. Uh, right. I'm going to skip over this. Uh, right, so this is another interesting uh, a tactic that you might want to use. Because uh, it's so common to want to try and, uh, if you have an assertion that's false, that's if you're trying to prove something that's clearly false, it's equivalent to just proving false. Cock actually has a special X falso tactic that uh, essentially just immediately changes the goal that you're trying to prove to false, to trying to prove false. Um, so uh, here, what we're going to do, if we want to show that B not equals a true implies uh, B is false, we're going to do the introduction thing. We're going to destruct B into two cases. In the case that B was equal to false, we have this assumption that false not equal to true. Um, wait, sorry, B equals false. False not equal to true. That's true, x false L, apply H. And these are backwards. So I think these cases are, are backwards. So in the case B not equal to true, yeah, this does seem backwards, right? So if B equals false, then obviously B equals false. So that should follow from reflexivity. So this is actually the case where B equals true. So now assume that assumption is true is not equal to true. Uh, and if we unfold not, we'll get true equals true implies false. Calling X false O replaces the goal with false. Now we're trying to prove false, and we get to we have to show we have an assumption that true equals true implies false. We can just apply that assumption and call reflexivity, and it solves the goal. Um, okay. Uh, there are a couple of exercises now, uh, thought exercises. So to prove the following proposition, which tactics will we need besides intros and apply? I will give everyone a second to think about it, and raise your hand when you think you know the answer. That'll give me time to recall the correct answer as well. Okay. Uh, someone volunteer an answer. Two, destruct and unfold. Well, yeah, I guess it's a little it's a little uh, ambiguous here if doing the intros with that special pattern matching syntax does destruct, but let's assume that it does. Uh, okay, so actually, what was the vote? <laughs> Two, Two. Two. Uh, destruct and unfold. Um, intros and apply. Yes. That looks right to me. Um, what about uh, this one? Uh, 
here. Five, only unfold. Besides intro and applies. So intros both of them. Five. Yes, five is correct. Uh, why is why is that the case? Well, walk through it. So we have not not p or q, which expands to p or q implies false, implies false. We can intro that. What do we have in our assumptions? Now we get to assume p or q. We assume p or q implies false, and we're trying to prove false. So from p or q implies false, we can apply that, and then we have p or q as an assumption. So in fact, we don't even need to unfold, but I guess it's, uh, oh right. Given the, the set of tactics you know right now, yes, you, don't, you, you, you need unfold. That is a true statement, okay. Um, how about this one? One of left and right. Just left, right? So what's the, so does someone want to give me the sequence of tactics they would do just off the top of their head? What would you do? Yeah. Intro, left, apply I, or exactly. Yeah, yeah, and so you would intro, let's say H, do left, and then you would apply H. Exactly right. Uh, and then finally, this one. Both left and right. Uh, oh, and yes, and we assumed we needed unfold for this yeah. from before. So it would. Uh, oh, actually, and you need destruct as well because you need to do case analysis on the P or Q in order to decide left which one of these not uh, which one of these disjunctions you're going to prove. So this is the all of the above uh, is the right answer. Okay. Oh, there's one last one. Okay. Uh, inversion. inversion. Yes, we can call inversion immediately on this uh, uh, one equals zero. Yep. And that is exactly right. Okay. Uh, okay. So what have we seen so far? We've seen and. We've seen or. We've seen not. We saw that not is actually has a special form of expanding into some proposition implies false. So we have false too. Uh, well, if we have false, you might ask, is there a true? Is there truth? The answer is yes. There's this uh, proposition called true. It has a special constant called i that's associated with it that has type true. Uh, and so if we want to prove something of, of, of type, if we ever want to prove true, we can just apply this constant. Um, Unlike false, which we use to, which we often use to, when we're trying to prove uh, statements which are false, true isn't very useful in general, right? Because it's a trivial thing to prove, and if you can imagine, if you have this trivial fact in the cons and in, in, in your set of assumptions, it doesn't give you any extra information, right? So if you know p and you're trying to prove q, and you say, oh, I know p and true, saying and true doesn't add anything, right? This like this. There's no real information you get from knowing that true is, is an assum as an assumption. So it's not actually that useful uh, as a hypothesis. There are some use cases where it is useful, and we'll see one of those in a second. Yeah? Uh, well, unit, the question was, shouldn't this concept have been called unit? And the answer was, the an one answer to this question is that unit is itself a type in cock already, so this would have clashed with that. Uh, uh, the other answer is that this, uh, this constant has, um, uh, the, def the, the name comes from uh, the logic, right? So uh, this was well established uh, outside, of, outside of cock. This is a naming convention. So, uh, but again, could have called it whatever you want, I suppose. Okay, so that's true. Uh, we have and, or, false, not, true. Uh, and now, 
here's another connective that tends to be quite useful, if and only if, which we can define solely using uh, operators that we already have in hand. So in particular, we can define if and only if um, to be uh, uh, for two propositions, P, uh, P and Q, uh, it, if and only if is defined P implies Q and Q implies P, right? And we have the special if and only if double arrow notation, uh, which uses this constant. So quick question, if I said check if, what type would I get back? Oh, well, there were a lot of, lot of answers. So some people said prop, some people said prop to prop to prop. The second one is the correct answer, right? Because if takes two arguments of type prop and it gives you a proposition, right? Um, right. Um, I, in the interest of time and AV delays, I'm going to skip through some of these if and only if statements. You can work through the exercises on your own. Um, and in fact, I'm going to skip over this little bit about how we can do rewriting with uh, if and only ifs. You can follow up on that in the book. Um, okay, to get to our final logical, uh, logical connective. So we have universal quantification, as you might expect. Uh, this, this allows us to make statements about all possible uh, values of a particular type. There is, of course, also existential quantification that allows us to make assertions about a particular value of that type. So uh, here's the, the quantifier in Koch. It exists xp. Um, if we want to prove a goal of this form, how do we prove that there exists something such that a property holds uh, for that particular value? Well, A, we have to exhibit a value for which that property holds, uh, which this particular value is typically called the witness of the existential. So it's an existential that witnesses the, the truth of the statement you can it this way. Um, so just as we had the split tactic for working with goals of type and, we have left and right for working with goals of the form. Uh, or for exists, we have this special exist tactic, um, which unfortunately here, uh, when we look at the code, we'll see uh, it's actually just exists written out. So this special quantifier get for formatted a little weird on the slides. So when we call exists, uh, it takes an argument. This tactic takes an argument. And in particular, the argument is the particular value that we're going to use to, uh, uh, we're going to show exhibit has this property. So in particular, if we want to show there exists a uh, natural number such that four equals that natural number plus itself, uh, we just need to exhibit a witness. So in this case, we'll say, ah, well, I know what this is, two. So once you say exists two, it's going to instantiate all occurrences of this existential variable with the value you've given and the goal. So we'll say exists two. Our new goal is going to be four equals two plus two, from which we can apply, use the reflexivity tactic and immediately uh, finish the proof. Um, conversely, okay, so that's how you build, that's how you, uh, work with goals of the form exists x. What do we do if we have an assu assumption of the form uh, exists x some property? Well, here we can use the destruct tactic and we call destruct on uh, exists x, what do we get? Well, we get two new assumptions. First, we get some witness and then we get an assumption saying that that particular value that we have, it's not a concrete value, has the property uh, that was asserted by this, uh, exist in, this exist in the body of this existential quantifier. Um, so the best way to do the, uh, uh, the best way to understand this is to see it in action. So, there we go. So here we go. Um, here, I mean, the intro is here and this should make it a little bit more read readable. Oops, so we destructed a little bit too soon. Uh, okay, so what are we trying to do here? So we get an assumption that there exists some m such that n equals four plus that m, and we need to show that there exists some o such that n equals two plus that o. So when we intros here, we're going to destruct this existential, existentially quantified hypothesis. Uh, and this is going to give us a, uh, a new variable representing the witness. In this case, we're going to call it m. 
and it's going to give us an assumption saying that this uh, variable that we introduced has the property we use in the existential quantifier. So we get this h of m assumption, namely that n equals 4 plus m. Okay. So now, with this in hand, uh, if we want to prove this goal, that there exists some O satisfying this property, we need to use the, we need to call the exist tactic with some concrete witness for which we can prove this fact. In this case, it turns out it's 2 plus m, the witness we got from the assumption. So once we call, uh, once we use this tactic, we get a new goal where all of the occurrences of O have been replaced with 2 plus m. Um, and now we just need to prove it. And this, it turns out, uh, follows immediately from our assumption HM, uh, or the, uh, the assumption we got from destructing the existential quantifier. And if we do a little simplification here, oops, oh, that notation went wacky. Um, never mind. We can apply that assumption directly, and we're done. Uh, so uh, there's probably a theme you'll notice here that when we have assumptions of a particular type, we can use destruct to do case analysis on them and we'll get some additional information. Uh, but when we're trying to prove goals that use one of these logical connectives, there are specialized tactics for each of them. Um, and to uh, figure out which ones to use at any given, po at any given point, it's usually dicti dictated by the form of the goal, but to figure out what they are, you just have to use them a little bit and then you'll get more familiar with them. Okay, those are all of the logical connectives that we're going to look at in this lecture. Um, now, let's look at uh, a particular use case of programming with these propositions. So here we're going to see where some of these, uh, uh, the propositions we saw, like uh, the true proposition we saw before is going to be useful. So we now have a bunch of logical connectives and we can imagine using these logical connectives to build up bigger and bigger propositions, right? Bigger and bigger statements, right? And that's precisely what we're going to do. So let's think about how we might use these connectives we've seen to define the property. There is some element that occur, occurs in a list L, right? So when can an element, uh, when is it the case that some element occurs in a list, right? Well, if L is the empty list, this can never hold, right? So uh, the property in the case that L is the empty list, X appears in L is always false, right? Otherwise, if uh, this list is, a, uh, is some value appended to some sublist, X is going to appear in that list, either if it's equal to the head of the list or it appears in the tail of the list, right? Now, what's cool about What's so nice about these propositions being first class objects is that we can actually work with them programmatically, right? We can define functions that will produce statements. So in particular, we can define a function that will produce a statement that is equivalent to x is the element of a list. And here is precisely that function. And it follows, its definition follows exactly these two cases we saw up here, right? So look at this fixed point. So this is a fixed point. It's uh, going to take some type of the, of the list it's going to take some element of that, some value of that type, and it's going to return a proposition, right? This is just like as before we defined this is three or uh, is three proposition, right? Only now it's a little bit more complicated because we're going to define this recursively. So what are we going to do? We're going to match L. In the case that L is the empty list, well, this could never hold, so X could not be an element of the empty list. Otherwise, uh, if X prime, if we have this cons case, Either x prime is equal to this element, right, if x is in the list, or x must be in the sublist. And if you can imagine for any particular list, right, we can run this function and produce a statement asserting whether or not an element is a member of that particular list. So, yes? Sorry, um, probably you answered before. Um, why is it useful here to have prop instead of pool? Because in, in, uh, in a yes. we do it with pool. I'm going, can I revisit that question? It's coming in a little bit okay. right after this. Yeah. Um, but I think it is, sorry, the question is why did we use bool, prop instead of bool to define this, uh, this lemma? Uh, 
And the answer is we'll see why in a little bit, which is a little unsatisfying. But uh, to see an example of this definition in action of list membership in action, we have down here this proof statement. So here we're saying we, we're, we're trying to prove a lemma and we construct the statement of this lemma programmatically, right? So here we have this in function. It's defined recursively over this list. And here's the element we're checking membership of, uh, checking the membership of. Hmm. So if we do simplification, what is it going to do? It's going to expand the definition of that function over that concrete list, right? So we're going to get this long sequence, uh, this long disjunction of uh, the particular element we're looking for, in this case four, is equal to each member of the list, right? Now, to prove this, we can just use our tactics for re working with goals of the form or something, right? So here, well, one is clearly not equal to four, so we're gonna go on the right brand, right hand branch. Two is clearly not equal to four. Uh, but now, uh, four is equal to four, we'll go left, and we can prove that immediately. So now we've established this proof. Which is, uh, this is pretty cool, right? We've defined a function that will give us a statement, just generically, and we use that to write a proof. Oh, uh, it's pretty sweet. Are there any, any questions about that? Yeah. yeah well, in this particular case, we only have constants, and the quality is decidable. I suppose you could have some kind of tactic that automatically does the search for you. And... Indeed, you could have a tactic that just discharges this automatically. And there is, in fact, a tactic in Cox Standard Library that will solve this goal immediately. Uh, and we will see uh, an, an example of that tactic in use, I think, on Wednesday. Um, but yes, that's exactly right. Yes? Is this, maybe you already said this and I missed it, but the equal sign in these expanded disjunctions, mm -hmm. that doesn't have computational content. That's exactly right. So the question was, does the EQ used in this statement have any computational content, and the answer is no. Uh, uh, I, there was a, a, yeah. So EQ is just another um, definition, uh, uh, prop, uh, another way, it's another inductively defined proposition that represents equality. And it lives in prop, and since it lives in prop, it doesn't have any computational content associated with it. Yes? So we, we use prop for things we do not want in the obtained algorithms. But what if I want to say, hey, X belongs to this list, here's a proof, and from the proof, you can get the exact location. Right? And so the indexing algorithm is correct because it's extracted from the proof. So how do I disentangle the proof and the index? Uh, the question, to, to restate the question, uh, it was, okay, suppose we did actually want this proof to be computationally relevant, and we wanted to be able to extract sort of the index of a particular element in the list from this proof uh, that we wrote here. The answer to that question is we would have to move the definition of this M, this, uh, the definition of N from prop to type. That's it. So there's, you, yeah. So if we just change that line from prop to type, we'd be good? Top line? Um, in some sense, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, I might as well just step through this one last example that of using n and uh, existential quantifiers. So here again, we're going to use n on a particular concrete list. So this is a little bit more interesting because now instead of um, working with uh, a concrete element of the list, right? We're going to assume that for some arbitrary n, n belongs to this list. So what does this look like? So after we do simplification, we see we're going to have three assumptions right, from the definition of this predicate, just expanding uh, this proposition just by expanding it out. So if two was an element of this list, it must either be the case that, uh, sorry, if n was an element of this list, it must either be the case that n was equal to two, n was equal to four, 
or false. Okay. So uh, when we intros these goals, what does this? So what does this mean? So we get to assume that either two equals n, four equals n, or false. In the case that it's false, the goal follows immediately. So when we destruct that, it disappears. Uh, and now we just have these two goals. So now we have the case that n equals two, and we can exhibit a concrete witness. Right? Uh, in this case, let me make sure. Yes, it's one. So we say one, we replace all the occurrences of n prime with one, and then we can rewrite with this uh, equality and the uh, uh, equality assumption, reflexivity solves goal. We can exhibit similarly the witness two for n prime. Uh, we can rewrite with our assumption, and then we're done. So, man, it's so cool. Uh, the idea that propositions are first class objects that you can generate programmatically and manipulate, it's, it's just a powerful idea and I, you'll be seeing it uh, in action quite a bit uh, as the week progresses. Okay. Um, we can also prove more generic higher level lemmas about n. Um, in particular, uh, right, so if we have a, conc instead of working over a concrete list, maybe we can prove something for all lists, right? We don't have any concrete lists in hand. How might we do that? Well, um, here's an example. So here's this nmap lemma. Um, it says that if x is a member of a particular list, then it must be the case that uh, this fun uh, applying a function, the, it must be the case that f of x is a member of mapping this function f over that list, right? So how does this proof work in action? So we're going to do induction over the list, and by doing induction over L, we're going to get two cases. One, where L equals nil, and one where L is equal to the cons of something, cons of a value onto a sublist, right? And once we replaced L with these concrete values, now we can evaluate the in predicate, right? So uh, in the case that L equals nil, we have this N assumption, right? And N, when L is nil, immediately becomes false. So we can just discharge false immediately. This intros is just destructing that false assumption. In the other case, where L equals uh, con, uh, X, uh, where the list is some value uh, uh, const onto the, some sublist, right? Now we can again evaluate n, and there are going to be two cases. There's the case where, uh, uh, I guess, x is equal to the first element of the list, x prime, and then there's going to be the case where x is an element of the sublist. So we can evaluate that out. We're going to get two cases. We have an or, and we're going to split them. Uh, in the case that x is the, equal to the head of the list, we can do some rewriting and apply the, or tact the tactics we have for working with ors. In the other case, we can, uh, in which x is an element of the sublist. Well, now we can use the inductive hypothesis and again, uh, apply our assumption about uh, x being an element of the, the sublist. Um, probably more helpful to walk through this, uh, walk through this in the proof buffer. So I encourage you to do that uh, on your own time. Um, okay, let's see, we've got 10 minutes left. Are there any, any questions about n? or this idea of uh, programmatically generating proof, uh, propositions. Yeah? No, that's not. Uh, the, the way to think of first class is that it is a distinguished object of the language that you can treat as data, you can pass around as a value, you can manipulate. Uh, because even if it were a higher order function, that higher order function is itself a first class member of the language that you could pass around. I know it's a little confusing. Yeah? Can you have a props between functions? Can you have a prop between functions? Like lambda equals lambda lambda. Ah, so you're asking lambda equals lambda lambda. Mm. Yes, you can have you can assert equalities hold between two different functions. So you could, yeah. And indeed, we'll see an example of that a little bit later in this logic uh, lecture. Are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, okay, right. So importantly, uh, 
proofs are themselves just first class objects. So, um, right. So we've seen that we can use check to ask cock to print the type of a particular expression, right? And we can also use check to ask what a th what theorem a particular identifier refers to. In other words, we can check if the name of a theorem and see what the statement of that theorem uh, is proving, right? What, what is the statement that the proof that that theorem represents is, uh, is associated with, right? So if we check plus com, we'll get the statement of the theorem. And indeed, this is actually a very convenient command because if you ever have some theorem you want to apply, you can always check it and see what, it's, uh, what, type, what the type of the statement of that theorem is before you apply it and see if you can actually apply it to the goal. Um, yes. Right, so the reason behind this, this is, a, this is a subtle point, is that after we write, we put the statement of the theorem we, with the theorem command, and then we walk through this proof, proof script, right, and then we hit QED, uh, what happens? So when we hit QED, Koch actually defines a proof object. So this is an object, this is a witness establishing the truth of the statement that we put up at the beginning of the theorem, right? and. The type of this proof object is precisely the statement of the theorem that we proved, right? So the, there's an analogy here in the sense that the type of a computational object tells us what we can do with that object. So uh, for instance, if we have plus and we look at the type of plus, it has type nat arrow nat arrow nat. So what does this mean? You give me two natural numbers and I'll apply plus to it and I will give you a natural number back, right? Similarly, the statement of a theorem tells us what you can use the theorem for. It's just a much richer sort of type, right? So if we have an object of type n equals m uh, implies n plus n equals n plus m, and you provided an argument, some witness uh, or proof that n equals m, it will give you a new proof back that n plus n equals n plus m, right? It's a, it's, uh, a much, you could think of it as being a much richer type of function. That's, there's an analogy here. This is a really uh, a very deep, deep concept, right? So it turns out that we can actually apply theorems as if they were functions, right? So uh, in Okay, so let's walk through a proof script to see how this works in action, right? So here we're trying to prove com commutivity of plus, right? This will be the last thing we do today. So this seems pretty straightforward, right? So um, we, um, <coughs> sorry, commutivity of plus, yeah. So we already, we imagine that we already have in hand this, this theorem uh, that x plus y equals y plus x. And we're trying to prove this bigger theorem. So the idea here is that we should be able to use this, this previously proven fact to make sure, uh, prove this larger theorem, right? So down here, um, uh, if we're trying to prove this, we can intro these things and we're going to write with plus com. Uh, let me actually step through this right now. See what happens, okay. So we're going to, so I will just note that we can check plus com and it's going to give us a type ooh, all the way down here. The type, this is a proof and the type of this proof object or the statement of this proof is that for all n, uh, n and m natural numbers, n plus m equals m plus n. So if we rewrite with this previously established fact, what do we get? Well, we're going to swap, um, let's see, make sure I'm swapping things correctly here. So here we're going to swap x and y plus x on the left-hand branch, right? So swap, so now uh, we've done that swap, and now if we rewrite again, uh-oh, we get back to the original goal. Uh, and the reason for this is that when Koch is doing rewriting, it's greedily selecting the, uh, the values for these quantified variables. And so it, uh, in the first case, it, it selects x for the first argument uh, to plus com and y plus z for the argument to the second, uh, to, as a second argument to plus com. 
And similarly, when we do it the other way, it's going to select those ar arguments again, only in opposite order. So we get back to where we started. So we're sort of hosed. Or are we? So instead of letting this rewrite tactic get to choose the variables for us, we're going to be a little bit more explicit. And we're going to tell rewrite precisely what variables to do, use. And how we're going to use, do this is in much the same way that you can partially apply a function to some arguments, right? We can apply plus to one, and then we'll, that will give us a function that adds one to any argument uh, you apply it to. Uh, we can apply this lemma statement to some concrete values and rewrite with it. So let's see what happens. Oops. So here we go, tank two. Uh, so intros plus com. So, okay, here we are. So if you look down here to the rewrite lemma, now we're going to say, we're going to explicitly tell cock that I want to use y for the first argument to this lemma and z for the second argument to this lemma. And now, make sure I get this right, yep. Now, when you do the rewrite, it's going to swap the y and z at the front, as you would expect, and now we have precisely the same uh, expression on either side of the equality, and we can apply reflexivity. So I think it, it's probably helpful here to check the type of plus com yz. Let's walk through this, so if we check plus com. Again, sorry, this is way down here. We have for all n and m, so give me an m and m, and I'll give you a proof that m plus m equals m plus n. If we partially apply this lemma to y, we're going to get a new proof that says, give me some concrete m, and I will give you a proof that y, which now is a specific value, plus that m is equal to m plus y, the specific value. So if I take it one step further, whoop, plus com yz, now I have the statement, this uh, equality fact, about two concrete values, in this case y and z. And if I rewrite with that, as we saw previously, I get precisely the intermediate goal I wanted, and I'm done. Okay. So the, the key takeaway here is that um, you're probably getting sort of glimpses of this already that functions and lemmas uh, are first class objects in cock and we can partially apply them and we can manipulate them in interesting ways. Uh, and similarly, propositions are first class objects in, in cock and we can manipulate them and build them in interesting ways, programmatically potentially. Uh, and this is one of the very powerful, uh, powerful proving techniques and reasoning techniques uh, that often get deployed in real clock developments. And on that note, it's already five o'clock, so I will delay the final section of this logic uh, lecture until next time. <laughs> Actually, if there are any questions, you can ask that now too. That's what I should have said. So like, there is units, and you're moving between the commands, and you move fast on the state changes, what do you press to do that? Are you asking about using yeah. proof general? So the question was, how do you advance the command and proof general? Yeah, you move to the next command, and the state changes. Yeah. That's cool, how do you do it? You hit Control-C, Control-N. Control-C, Control-N? Yeah, and so proof... next to the Yeah. Right. How do you make your slides? You can also go back. You can also go back and hit Control-C, Control-U, but... Proof general, I mean not proof general, cock ID has similar hotkeys that should do the same thing, yeah? Control arrows. Control arrows, yeah. Yeah. So you can do the same thing in cock ID if you want. How do you make your slides? The slides are, uh, these slides were built uh, from the software foundations. Um, I can tell that. Yeah. You would have to ask Benjamin Pierce about precisely how these things are generated. Uh, slides, for, uh, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, um, there are lots of hacks involved. Yeah. Uh, 
the question was, how are these slides generated? The answer was, it's very hacky. But, uh, <laughs> but it looks nice, so yeah. Are, are there any other questions? Okay, great. Uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.